In the second segment of this series of video lectures, we're going to jump in and try to understand why having the U.S. specialize in wheat and Japan specialize in computers can increase global production of both goods, even though each country used the same number of labor hours, and allow for mutually beneficial trade to take place. And what we're going to see here is that there are two ways to measure the costs of production. One way we've already seen just from setting up the problem. We can measure the cost of production as the input cost required to produce a unit of output. So the US required 100 hours of work to produce a computer or 10 hours per ton of wheat. And that's one way of measuring the input cost required to produce those types of output. But another way to measure it is the opportunity cost of producing a good. And we could go ahead and think about it as how much wheat did we have to give up per computer produced? So we could think of the cost of the computer as 100 hours of labor, or we could think of the cost of the computer as 10 tons of wheat. And those are both important pieces of information. They both give us ways to look at asking who is the more efficient producer of a good. The first way of comparing who is more efficient uses that first idea of what is the labor cost per unit of output or what is the production per hour. And this relates to the idea of who has the absolute advantage. So absolute advantage is determined by comparing the productivity of one person or nation compared to another. And whoever requires less input to produce a unit of output, or whoever has more output per unit of input, has the absolute advantage in producing that good. But we also have the second way of comparing who is more efficiently producing a good. And that goes to the idea of comparative advantage. Comparative advantage is determined by looking at opportunity costs. And whoever has the smaller opportunity cost of producing a good has the comparative advantage in producing that good. And the idea here is that even if you're really, really good at everything, even if my wife is better at everything than I am, there are some areas where her advantage is largest and some areas where her advantage is smallest. The areas where her advantage is largest are her comparative advantages. And in a way, comparatively speaking, she is at a disadvantage on the areas where her advantage is smallest. Because if we were competing in, in a, to produce things, she would have sort of the best advantage where she, her superiority over me was greatest. Likewise, if I'm worse at everything, there are gonna be some areas where I'm only a little bit worse, and some areas where I'm a lot worse. And if we were to somehow compete, I would want to, to compete on the areas where I was least worst. So comparatively speaking, that would be my advantage. And the area where I was most worst, that would be my comparative disadvantage. And notice, everyone has the comparative advantage in something, there's something where they're most best or least worst, and the comparative disadvantage in something else. There's something where they are least best or most worst. I'm going to go ahead and let you guys try and think through who and what goods the U.S. has the comparative or absolute advantage and try and answer this question. What we're going to see is that specialization is more closely tied to comparative advantage than it is to absolute advantage. And when producers specialize according to their comparative advantage, production ends up happening where it has the lowest opportunity cost. So think about where would you want to produce computers in this example. If you produce a computer in the US, 
you give up 10 wheat for every computer that you produce. If you produce a computer in Japan, you only give up 5 wheat for every computer you produce. So, if you were planning this little economy, you would go ahead and say that we should produce as many of the computers in Japan as possible so that we give up the least amount of wheat possible to produce those computers. Likewise, if we're looking at producing wheat, if we produce it in the US, we give up one-tenth of a computer, one-tenth of a U one tenth of a computer per unit of wheat. If we produce the wheat in Japan, we give up one fifth of a computer per unit of wheat. And if you're going to give up computers to produce wheat, it's better to only give up one tenth than it is to give up one fifth. So you would want to produce the wheat in the US. So when each country specializes according to its comparative advantage, again, we've relocated production to where it has the lowest opportunity cost. And when we do that, we can produce more output without using any additional labor. We can produce more output without anyone having to work any harder. And we don't even have to have any more technology in the traditional sense of that word of new machines and so on and so forth. So this looks a lot like a free lunch. Notice this example and this model in this chapter is really a very limited way of looking at the potential for trade to create gains. So what we're doing in this chapter, the Ricardian model, is an example of what we call static comparative advantage. That is, each of the countries has their fixed labor costs, and when they specialize in a certain good, that doesn't change things. But you can easily imagine a situation where as you specialize in something you get better at it that if the u.s specializes in wheat it reduces its labor cost of producing wheat a little bit or if japan specializes in producing computers it's able to develop skills and dedicated facilities for doing that and that makes a japan a more efficient producer of computers if people could develop higher skill in the things they specialize in, which pretty clearly they can, that would actually expand the gains from trade. So in many ways, this model in this chapter underemphasizes the potential gains from trade. Even if we're not looking at the production side of the economy, there are potential gains from trade from different preferences. And maybe this is more relevant at the level of individuals than nations, but it's still important. Some people really would not want to be a salesperson who has to go out and sort of be socially extroverted and maybe even a little aggressive, and that would be very painful for some people, even if they were actually capable of it. Other people might find it exceedingly painful to spend all day behind a computer doing computer coding or designing websites or doing accounting. That would just be really, really painful, even if they were capable of it. And the fact that when people specialize and trade their services with each other, they can specialize in things that suit their preferences, gives us an intangible level of economic welfare. We can't measure it in terms of units of computers or wheat, but pretty obviously it's a benefit. Again, going back to the idea of international trade, many industries have what we call economies of scale, where as you produce more units, the cost per unit goes down, that bigger firms are more productive than smaller firms. So if we have international trade, there's more potential for firms to get large enough to take advantage of these economies of scale. At the same time, one of the problems with economies of scale typically is that they potentially lead to monopolies. And in particular, if we have economies of scale, there's an important or significant problem that one firm might be the monopolist in each country due to the economies of scale problem. 
But if firms trade across international borders, then although there may be only one firm producing a good in each country, they compete with each other by sending their goods back and forth across international borders. So there might be each country has its own national monopolist producer of steel, but if the US firm starts trying to exploit its monopoly power and really raise prices up, then the Japanese or Chinese or European steel firms are going to send their steel to the US and weaken the ability of the US monopolist to increase prices. So international trade allows us to have the best of both worlds, really. It allows us to have economies of scale without some of the monopoly problems that often come along with that. And then last here, not easily measured, but pretty clearly, we're better off for the fact that international trade gives us an increased variety of goods, that we can experience music or food, from different sorts of countries, or Japanese cars are different from American cars, and maybe for some purposes, American cars are better, and for other purposes, Japanese cars are better, and we're better off for the fact that we're able to consume an increased variety of goods.